Hello, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear adaptive training. I'm Srikant Subraman from Systems and Control IIT Ball. So we just started the 12th week of our lectures in this NPTEL course. So this being the final week, I sort of started off a little bit with a little bit of history of how adaptive control worked. And this is what we were looking at until this time. So, if you, um, so we were looking at this paper by Anaswamy. This is a paper that, of course, I will post. Um, and we were essentially looking at the chronology of how things evolved. Uh, we, of course, saw a few things on how you started with the requirement for adaptation, then we had this optimal optimality based MIT rule. And then there was a need for stable adaptive control. Um, beyond that, we also had normal reference adaptive control, nonlinear adaptive control, and uh, epsilon sigma modifications, parameter learning. But then there was also this parallel world where there was development for this um, stochastic discrete time systems. Then there was the notion of uh, learning, which was uh, like like neural networks, adline filters which involved parameter estimation again, or weight estimation again. And then there was uh, not from the reinforcement learning, which involved um, you know, uh, the use of neural networks to estimate uh, some value functions and so on. And so overall, there is, uh, it's, there is a lot of parallel developments where the notion of parameter learning was playing a rather big role. So, uh, this was sort of what we have seen. Um, I quickly want to uh, wrap up our discussion here on this paper. Of course, I will put this up. We have not even discussed half of the article, and it's very difficult to discuss it in entirety. Um, but a lot of it are things beyond this. A lot of it are material that we have covered in this course, and so it should not be very difficult for you to follow. So. This is where I start my lecture 12.2. Right? Um, so, um, one of the problems that, uh, of course, started to be discussed in parallel with the evolution of adaptive control was the pattern recognition and classification problem. So, in this, uh, what happens is that there are usually two classes A and B, um, and, and uh, here there is uh, basically some features which are denoted by xk and there is an output which is denoted by yk and usually these outputs are in the form uh, given in equation 21. So this framework was of course in Yakubovich and Novikov also. Um, so the, um, you know, what we want to do was to classify these events. Right? And so the question that was uh, sort of asked is, is there, um, is there such a, are such of these, they're possible to separate these uh, classes by a hyperplane? Right? And what does it mean to classify um, objects or these images into a hyperplane? It means um, asking the question of whether there exists some parameter thetas and theta not such that you can write uh, this output in this linear relationship with the parameters. So this is this, uh, and of course this phi is some suitable kernel function or regressor in our adaptive control framework. Right? So how this works is you, you sort of expose the model to a lot of features and the goal is to learn, uh, you know, this value theta theta zero so that you can classify any further images after the learning process into classes A and classes B. So, uh, and, and of course, I mean, how you separate them into classes is, of course, I mean, you look at this value right here, right? I mean, whether you get, if you get one, you are in class A, say, and if you're minus one, you are in class B, right? So that's how you do this classification problem, right? So this is the 
image classification problem. But then in recent times, we would have seen sort of data classification problems also. Right? Um, so uh, the interesting thing is now, again, this problem is reduced to identifying some parameters. And uh, uh, of course, you can use this gradient type algorithms in order to find the values for these parameters to a pre-specified accuracy, of course. Okay. And, and of course, there are many gradient type solutions, such as the one you see here, which is you will see that it is not very different from your adaptive feedback loop or adaptive update loop here. Right? It, this is just in discrete time, but has a very similar feel to your adaptive update. Right. So, um, so of course there is this. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, this this sort of interesting idea. Of course, there's an alternative approach where you choose uh, some vector of weight such that. Uh, this corresponding hyperplane is a supporting hyperplane to the convex hull of all these vectors, right? So, so you sort of construct these vectors y x k phi x k, and then you um, sort of uh, find these hyperplanes that are supporting hyperplanes to the convex hull of these vectors, right? So, uh, so then, uh, and of course, so that the minimum distance from it to the convex hull is uh, maximum. Right? So, so this is sort of how uh, the support vector machine methods were uh, had come about. But then you also see that there is this uh, alternative method that we discussed first, and these, uh, you know, are, are sort of closer to what we do in adaptive control. Right? So, anyway, so. Um, then there was, of course, um, also the notion of reinforcement learning or adaptive dynamic programming. Right? So I'm going to highlight this, that the fact that reinforcement learning is essentially adaptive dynamic programming. And why is that? Uh, the idea is that you have some you know, nonlinear evolution, and then you have what is called a control law, which is called a policy in, in this discrete uh, dynamic programming framework. So uh, policies, essentially, you have uh, different control uh, values at different instants of time, mu1, mu2, and so on. And then there is this notion of a performance index that you want to minimize. This performance index is like an infinite series, or infinite sum yeah, of this uh, value function g. Okay. Um, right? So the end is j pi is called a cost function. And the idea is to find the optimum Right. You want to find the optimal, and where is the optimal? If you see, the, the, it's, it's, you can see that it is indexed with a pi, and this pi is this policy. So it's an optimal with respect to the policy. So you find the control law, if you may, yeah, or a control policy such that this infinite sum is minimum. So you have to choose. So it's not, it's not just one choice of controller in discrete time. It's actually infinitely many choices, right? So you have mu one, mu two, mu three all the way to new infinity because you can see that this is an infinite sum, right? So, um, so then uh, in order to sort of look at this problem, how dynamic programming does it, uh, and of course this is this is the expression for j pi star, you can see that it is infimum with respect to the control policy pi. Right? So using the Bellman's optimality principle, what you can, uh, the value iteration process is, is essentially organized like this. So the optimal, how you read this is that the optimal at the k plus 1th time is simply the infimum overall control values admissible, admissible control values. So ux is the control, admissible control set. So the admissible control means that suppose your control is to be bounded between, you know, absolute value of control has to be less than 1. So that would be this set. So, so you essentially look at the infimum overall control values of the function g and the optimal cost at the k times added to it. So this is how you uh, sort of progress from one step to another in order to find the optimal control for that step. So this is the optimal value of u for that step. So uh, of course to solve this there is a very very large number of function computations to be done and so the idea here is to use a neural approximation for the function jk and that 
essentially is approximated using as always a regressor phi yeah and a set of parameters w so you again see that there is a set of unknown vectors wk which are weights in this case cause weights and then there are phi's which are some truncated basis functions right? and these are used to uh, uh, approximate the value function this is what is the basis for you know doing reinforcement learning um, and and this identifying these weights is what is the adaptive part of this. this is the connection with adaptive control because you see that again i have some parameters that need to be learned. I mean, you can call them weights, but eventually they are parameters that need to be learned. The only problem here is that um, uh, if there are disturbances, then talking about stability is rather difficult because, you know, um, you, you sort of have to, if you want to look at uh, stability and evolution of trajectories, you have to integrate over all such trajectories. And this has to be some kind of Monte Carlo method that has to be introduced. And therefore it is very difficult to, uh, you know, I mean, come up with stability conditions for a closed loop system. I mean, there are of course, um, you know, some results out there um, that talk about these, uh, but that is of course not a part of this article that we see here, right? So anyway, so this is, sort of where we stop our little bit of a history lesson. Uh, subsequently, there is many other sections in this paper on solutions in adaptive control and so on and so forth. And a lot of other interesting uh, topics that have been covered in adaptive control. Um, so it gives a little bit of a flavor of everything there is in adaptive control. Some of this, of course, we have covered in our uh, curriculum here and some of it we have not. So I would strongly encourage you to uh, look at this article. To get a good idea of um, where we stand in terms of adaptive control and how it's connected to learning. Uh, what I want to do now is to again go to another article, if you may. Right? Uh, okay. I don't know why I have to pay this or that. I apologize. All right. So I want to sort of go here to this article. And this is an article, it's from 1996 from uh, Frank Lewis uh, and co-authors. And uh, this article actually talks about implementation of uh, an adaptive controller via multi-layer uh, neural network, or, sorry, or an adaptive controller via multi-layer neural networks. Um, and this is being used as a robot so this is one of the probably one of the first uh, multi-layer implementations of uh, neural network adapt adaptive control in neural networks uh, with with nice tracking stability performance results. Yeah, which is so. Therefore, I sort of uh, wanted to look at this article with you uh, in this last week so that you can get an idea of how actually stability guarantees in neural networks can be provided, yeah. So again, you see that this is an old article and this is a rather specific article. We, uh, we uh, look at real-time application of neural network. In a lot of literature that you see now or a lot of applications that you look at now, uh, most learning algorithms are, um, implement, are offline implementations in the sense that the entire training of the algorithm happens offline, right? but this is one of the few uh, results that you will see, especially connected to control, where you have online learning of the adaptive controller also. Now, uh, one can of course question, uh, you know, the advantage and disadvantage of either. Uh, of course, it is true that if you do offline training, you can take in a lot more data and you can do much better learning of parameters and uh, learn probably for a larger variety of cases and so on. But one of the problems is that with with uh, uh, you know with this offline learning and then implementation online is that if your initial conditions and your um, uh, you know of of your dynamical system and your operational conditions of your dynamical system changes a lot, right? Uh, then 
um for example if i if i did a lot of uh, you know I, i wanted to look at a sector and i want to fly uh, you know my unmanned vehicle using uh, some images right? image processing right? and i made a map for example uh, you know in in, in dawn at dawn time. so i i did all my training uh, at early morning and i use images that i obtain using an early morning flight a bunch of early morning flights using this uav but then i suppose i fly my uh, you know i actually fly my uav um, in in the evening time where the light is a little bit less or maybe in the daytime where the light is a little bit more uh, then uh, the results become significantly different so if the initial conditions operational conditions change uh, from the training data then your performance can significantly deteriorate on the other hand if you um, are actually uh, using some kind of an online uh, learning of this neural network then uh, you can continue to learn even when things change and you know you you don't deteriorate your performance significantly so that's one of the advantages but of course the limitation is that you can only have a few layers you know for computational efficiency and um, uh you know and, and in order to be able to implement things in real time right so that's the idea we are looking at a real time implementation of a multi layer neural network uh and we do this in the adaptive control framework that we have seen right so um, so a lot of uh, results have been written about this adaptive neural network um and and but there is little about the use of neural network in direct close with computers Okay. at least until 96 there is a little bit more now uh, but again not a lot yeah this is still an open area of research especially the part about proving stability yeah uh, so um, one of the issues is is, is sort of um, that need to be addressed adequately is the, is you uh, know is the inclusion of ad hoc controller structures and the inability to guarantee satisfactory performance so uh, so one of the things that is required in a lot of articles that these authors mention is that um, um, you need you know initial estimates for the neural network weights in order for performance to be good yeah and identifying such stabilizing weights may not be very easy yeah before you even start running the system right so uh, so the idea in this article as the authors say is to confront these deficiency Uh, for full nonlinear three layer non neural network with arbitrary activation functions um uh, of course there is a uh, concepts of robot control get discussed here a little bit because the application is a robotic manipulator and uh, the tracking performance is guaranteed using lyapunov assurance uh, even though there is no ideal weights uh, that is identified and uh, typically when you use a Um, a standard adaptive controller for a robot right the regress the regressor matrix the regressor matrix that is used in all these uh, needs to be very previously computed for every specific robot for example if i go from a three link robot to a five link robot or you go from a uh, you know linear joint to a articular or a you know, rotary joint things change significantly so you have to compute the regressor matrix very carefully in order to apply an adaptive controller right but the advantage of using a neural network based adaptive control is that it will automatically learn these parameters right so these uh, using these activation functions so it can be applied for any serial link robotic arm okay so this is the advantage if one controller works for any serial link robotic arm just like a package yeah so uh, one of the things that is sort of demonstrated in this article is that the standard tuning using back propagation based methods yields um, can yield unbounded neural network weights um and uh, especially when there is uh, you know disturbances uh, you know and and, and uh, the robot arm is more than one link which is you know sort of a very very basic requirement that the robot arm may have more than one link so there are modified weight tuning methods are also proposed here uh, which which of course uh, you know select the epsilon modification yeah so um so the modified weight tuning approach is also uh, you know the, the authors claim that they uh, can avoid the p condition um, which is also something rather good rather strong right rather a strong result 
now um so let's sort of start uh, looking into what the problem setup is right so we know that we are doing learning using adaptive methods so typical neural network uh, parameter estimation algorithms can rely on some kind of um, you know again gradient descent type formula some kind of optimization based formula but here everything is based on adaptive control and lyapunov based results which helps us to prove stability and close loop performance which will not usually be guaranteed in a optimal framework right that, that in the standard framework for offline identification of these parameters so the other thing of course is that we do online identification and online uh, tuning of the neural network so that is another thing that we are looking to do yeah so we do this um yeah if in a, in a particular framework and this framework is what we are going to look at yeah so we already know what all these real numbers rn and rm cross n and all that one important thing is that uh, we we're looking at functions f which um, go from some uh, compact connected set in rn to rm uh, and and um, the the set of continuous functions in this space s is denoted as cms right um then we also we've already seen the notion is infinity norm so this is essentially the supremum norm is the same right it is um similar in fact it takes the the any norm of the vector norm of the function and it takes supremum of that uh, for over all the x in s over all x in this domain you take the supremum of the vector norm yeah? so this is what is called the supremum norm then there is the frobenius norm we also saw this when we were looking in Uh, at model reference adaptive control so the frobenius norm of a matrix is just the square of the frobenius norm is the trace of a transpose a okay. uh, it's not a vector norm it's actually just uh, it's essentially look, uh, looking at the matrix as a vector and computing the you know, it somehow vector transpose itself of the matrix uh, by stacking the matrix column columns into a vector uh but of course it, it's not a vector it's not an induced norm the way we've defined induced norms i hope all of you remember but it is in fact compatible with an induced norm right so if, if you take the two norm of ax then it is less than equal to the frobenius norm of a times the two norm of x right so this sort of inequalities are rather useful right whenever we do sum of square kind of uh, decomposition or you know some cauchy schwarz step inequalities we want to use in a lyapunov analysis you know that these kind of inequalities are very useful for us right uh, of course we say that this a matrix a of t is bounded if the infinity norm induced norm of this matrix is bounded right excellent now uh we want to of course see what a typical neural network looks like in this case we are uh, looking purely at the three layer neural network so there are three layers in the sense that there is an input layer here there is an output layer here so all these uh, sorry uh let me be careful yeah so there is a input here there is a hidden layer here and there is an output layer here. yeah input hidden layer output yeah whichever way you want to look at it yeah so there is so anything in the middle of input and output is called a hidden layer yeah it's as simple as that yeah because it's neither the input nor the output so yeah, you don't look at it so it's the hidden layer okay so this is the three layer neural network structure these vi vijs are the weights here wijs are the weights here and then you have these sigmas which are basically like activation functions so this is how neural network works you have some n1 uh inputs going in then they are scaled by some weight right here and then they are summed up because you see there is a summing action here because of everything goes into everything else so every input feeds into every uh you know every node if you may so so there is the scaling and then there is the summing action over the n1 nodes and then there is an offset which is added Right. um and then it passes through this activation function so uh, i think it's better to write it as this so the activation function acts on this and once the activation function sigma acts on this it's again goes to the second layer so of course there is again weights right 
and that's the way it's here and then uh, you know then there is again a summation sorry and then there is again an offset and then there is a summation all right so this is what is the output right so so you can see that uh, you have an input layer a hidden layer and then an output layer all right so this is what is the three layer neural network one input one output and a hidden layer in between right so there is one activation function signal all right so uh, uh, so we have several things you can see that are already unknown what a typical neural network um, implementation would try to identify are these offsets and these weights because once i identify these offsets and these weights of course these are these uh, n1s and n2s are pre chosen quantities right so once i identify these offsets and these weights uh, i have an exact an almost exact relationship between the input and the output okay so so don't get confused by our control systems terminology the input is not the control output is not the output of the system and all that this is for any non linear function and yes, for any non linear function which is getting approximated in this if you take any non linear function it can be approximated in this and that's the whole idea and that's the whole idea now uh, in this case we are doing the real time neural network implementation therefore we want them to exhibit learning while controlling yeah, we are not okay with learning first and then uh, finding some parameters good values of parameters then using it for control and so on as a separate problem no we are looking at jointly learning and control now what are standard choice of uh, you know these activation functions are these like sigmoidal functions these are like sigmoidal functions are like uh, smooth signum functions hyperbolic tangent functions we already know hyperbolic tangent functions we saw them for the purpose of projection based adaptive controllers and then you have these radial basis functions these are essentially like um, the functions that you see in this bell curve in normal distributions and things like that yeah so all these are very nice functions for function approximation that is why these choices are made it's not just arbitrary functions i wouldn't take a linear function here for sigma yeah so all these functions are somehow uh, functions that help you to do good function approximation yeah so so how we want to write this whole equation one uh, is in a very compact um, you know again parameter regressor form right so this looks like a i would say non linear parameter regressor bond this looks like a non linear parameter regressor why so how we do this is first of all we define our x with an x0 so there are you see there are n1 x is here but i add one more x to it as x0 okay and then what i do is uh, this sort of lets you to accommodate this theta okay in this v so the first column of v uh, contains a threshold theta w l um right uh, i'm sorry i was here so so if you have x0 chosen as one vector of one then you can include uh, you know this threshold vector into the rings right so if you look at then if you compute v transpose x it should be evident to you that because the first column of x is one yeah then uh, sorry because x0 is one not first column because x0 is one if i choose the first column of v as the theta v's then this is exactly what i have inside and similarly i can do for the w's also right i take this sigma activation function but again the first term of this activation function is chosen is just written as one and so the activation function of course uh, if i write it as sigma z that for a vector it operates it's assumed to operate element wise sigma z1 sigma z2 but if i make the first element to be 1 here then i can incorporate in w uh, this 
offsets also. Okay, and once I do that, I can actually write y equal to w transpose sigma v transpose x, which is essentially like a nonlinear parameter regressor form. All right, so nonlinear because both w and v are parameters. It's not like a y theta equal to u kind of a thing, not as simple as that, but a little bit more complicated. Yeah. So, so any tuning function basically w and v includes you know all the thresholds and the offsets and everything. Right. So that's the idea. So great. So what did we see in this session? We sort of finished our discussion on this very interesting article which, which chronologically discusses how adaptive control developed, how it got connected with learning, uh, how reinforcement learning and deep neural networks essentially are parameter doing parameter identification in a different framework. And uh, now we've started to look at the basic problem uh, of uh, doing real-time uh, neural network based control of a robotic manipulator. And here the neural uh, network uh, weights are going to be adjusted using our Lyapunov based adaptive control theory. And uh, that's what we are sort of trying to set up the framework for that. And uh, in the subsequent session, of course, we will continue to look at this. Right. So I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.